Well, thank you, David, and thank you for inviting me here to the Institute, my first time in this Institute, uh, although not my first time in a group of physicists. I'm glad to say I have many friends amongst physicists. I've enjoyed the, uh, working with physicists over the last 20 or 30 years, so that sometimes people think I've given up mathematics, but I haven't entirely. Um, <clears throat> now, this is, of course, meant for a general audience, and though there are some mathematicians and physicists in the audience, the talk is really designed for those who are not in that, those two groups. Uh, although they might learn something as well. Um, and the, the talk is, uh, the title indicates, uh, concerned with question about the nature of space. I chose that title because it, you know, it's, it's sufficiently broad, it covers almost everything. Um, and it, as you can tell from the title, it is a somehow, uh, involves a, a philosophical question. So the fundamental philosophical questions um, start, are concerned with the relation between um, the world outside and what we, the pictures we build of it in our minds and the uh, theories that we develop to understand that. And uh, there are different schools of thought which have always been there, are still present in the present time, between those who, like Plato, uh, believe in an ideal world, the world with whose reality is uh, unchallengeable, where all these marvelous theories take place, in particular, uh, in the time of the Greeks, the notions of Euclidean geometry, of geometry, a point, what is a point? A point is something which has position but no magnitude. Well, that can't really exist in the real world, uh, and a triangle you draw is always a bit of a fuzzy triangle, but outside in some imaginary world, or my, world of the mind, there is this perfect triangle with straight lines and, and, and points which have no size. So, idealism is concerned with describing this world of, of ideas, of theoretical concepts, of that, of that which are embodied in the human mind. Um, and then the, the idealists believe that really what we see outside is a, just a reflection of what's in our minds. The reality is in our minds, and what we see outside is some pale reflection of that. At the other extreme, there are the pragmatists or the realists, whom David Hume, the philosopher, was exponent, who believe that really everything we learn comes from experience. We learn things from the real world, we absorb it, and then we make our attempt to describe that by building appropriate mathematical models. So these are the two views uh, about the nature of theoretical ideas in the mind and space outside. We, uh, which is the real thing? Is it the space that exists outside which we try and describe, or is it the idea in the mind which is the fundamental notion? Uh, Kant was, without doubt in the mind, most people, the greatest philosopher of all time, uh, attempted to answer this question in a typically um, complicated way. That's why I put a question mark here. Um, he, he tried to have the best of both worlds. He, some things he thought were fundamental, and some things he learned were, were, were learnt. And so he, he produces balance, and uh, one of the reasons it's difficult to understand him is first he wrote in very difficult German, and secondly he changed his mind over the years. So <laughs> I have not found anybody who can give us a real explanation of what Kant's views were, but you, you get a general idea. Uh, now, amongst the general questions about the world outside, uh, people are will focus on space, because space, in a way, embodies uh, the fundamentals. Things take place in space, and you can't understand anything unless you understand space. So, you can focus on this question in the simplest form. What is space? And then, uh, when you develop a, ma a theory, that theory nowadays it has for a long time taken a mathematical form, uh, and the question is, what is the role of mathematics? Uh, what is the nature of mathematics itself? And in particular, what is the nature of, nature of geometry? And Kant, for example, had a lot of discussion about that question. I remember uh, w when I was a student in Cambridge inviting a very distinguished professor of philosophy to come to lecture to us, and the lecture was all about, by the way, lectures by professors of philosophy are always very serious affairs. They read very tightly knit text, not like mathematicians who waffle. So th this lecture was all about, you know, Kant's views on the difference between left-handed and right-handed gloves. What is the difference between right-handed and left-handed gloves? And Kant spent pages and pages. And I, I remember the time I went to lecture on topology and we thought we understood about the difference between right-handed and left-handed things. And so I suggested to the professor that afterwards that you know, perhaps things had moved on since Kant's time and we mathematicians now understood a little bit more about it. But he put me very firmly in my place. You know, who was I to question the great Kant? I was a mere student, so I retired very hurt very quickly. But I think subsequently, 50 years later, I was right. 
Uh, now, uh, just to give you, I'll put up a few pictures of the heroes of the past, so you know, you will remember that uh, all these ideas are due to people. So here is a picture, uh, if not of Plato himself, at least the picture of what Raphael thought Plato looked like. Uh, it comes from the famous painting, The School of Athens. Um, I'm afraid I don't have, don't have two copies of the Transparencies, otherwise I've kept it on you all the time so you can admire that while I'm talking. Um, now, the relationship between mathematics and physics, uh, which I've tried to indicate here, uh, is twofold. Um, mathematics takes from the world of physics outside abstraction. It tries to abstract out and uh, unify principles and develop uh, some abstract theory. And then it feeds that theory back into the physics for the application. So it's a two-way process. It takes the material, develops it up, and feeds it back as a theory. But underneath the world of mathematics and physics, you want to think of something else. Physics is about the real world, at least it's supposed to be. Uh, there are things happening out there. Physicists build experimental equipment, they measure things, and they say they're dealing with the real world. Mathematics takes place in the mind, as I explained. Uh, and the, the passage between mathematics and physics is in some sense a passage between the mind and the real world. That link takes place at two levels. The mind perceives the real world. We have our senses, our eyes, our ears. We get sources of information about the real world. But on the other hand, uh, the mind is part of the human body, which is part of the real, of the real world. It's part of biology. So, human beings are not independent of the real world, they are embedded in it. And that's a very important thing to bear in mind. And I'll come back to say a bit more about that, in particular in con connection with, with evolution. Now, the one way of putting the fundamental dichotomy in mathematics, uh, which uh, is this following, um, are mathematical concepts and theorems, are they invented or are they discovered? And mathematicians uh, argue this at great length, uh, although I think most of, or well, many mathematicians really feel they've invented things that discover them, they feel they were there before they came in to look at them, and that rather reduces your contribution. So they think they invented them. Now, uh, the one big difference between inventions and um, discoveries, which is particularly appropriate, probably in the United States more than anywhere else, is that you can't patent an invention. Sorry, you can patent an invention, you can't patent a discovery. Only inventions can be patented. So, for example, uh, Newton's laws of gravity uh, were, were there for him to discover. And so they weren't an invention, he couldn't patent them. Which is a great pity, because if he'd patented them, mathematicians ever after would have been living on the royalties. <laughs> and any theory I, I produce, unfortunately, can't be patented. So that's sort of putting the dichotomy in what I might call a commercial nutshell. Now, uh, examples of the sort of things in mathematics which you can ask whether they invented or discovered, let's start at the bottom. Mathematics uh, starts off at least with things like numbers. Number is the sort of bedrock of, of mathematics. The first of all, you start with the integers. One, two, three, four. Those are where you start. Then having got the integers, you can do more complicated things. Uh, you start forming ratios, fractions. Ration, we call them rational numbers. And then not all the numbers you want to deal with can be written as fractions. There are more nasty things called, which mathematicians call irrational. You see, begin, mathematicians begin to look for words that indicate that things are somehow not partially fictitious. Irrational numbers are numbers which you, which you write down in, in decimals and never stop. And like the square root of 2 or pi and so on. So irrational numbers are important. Then mathematicians have other terms, which I won't explain in detail, like transcendental. That almost suggests something mystical. But transcendental has a very precise mathematical meaning, but it involves some extra degree of complication. And then the most striking of all are imaginary numbers. And our imaginary numbers uh, are things which don't exist. Obviously, they're imaginary. And the most famous imaginary number is the basic one, is the square root of minus one. Every number multiplied by itself, every square, is positive because negative times a negative makes a positive, and the positive times a positive makes a positive. So there's no number whose square is minus one. So the square root of minus one does not exist. Period. But mathematicians being obstinate chaps, said, well, never mind, let's, let's, let's play around with this symbol. Let us imagine what the world would look like if we had a minus, square root of minus one. And they went on playing around with this for several centuries until finally they convinced themselves that, you know, we should allow it. And that wasn't just a, um, you know, because they enjoyed it. They found it very useful. They found it very useful even to solve problems which, which the word imaginary didn't figure at the beginning or the end. 
only figure on the route as a tool. So imaginary numbers uh, turn out to be remarkably uh, important for mathematics, but you can say, well, they certainly don't exist. You know, so that, that, that must be an, an invention. And I think that the imaginary numbers, the square root of minus one, is probably the biggest single invention of the human mind in history. You know, it's a fantastic invention. It really wasn't there. We, somebody invented it, it took several hundred years, and it has been enormously important. And I'll come back again more about that. Complex numbers are made up of ordinary numbers and imaginary numbers. Now, the German mathematician Kronecker, who had a rather philosophical outlook, took a very rigid view. He said, God made the integers, all else was made by man. That's a very extreme view, limiting God's role rather significantly. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I think complex numbers, including many, seems to me a very convincing example of invention. But, and here's the striking point, they are now, we know now in the 20th century and the 21st, that they are fundamental in the world of quantum physics. Quantum physics is built up in a very fundamental way with complex numbers, and it can't be done with real numbers. With the square root of minus one is absolutely fundamental to quantum physics. Yet, it was an imaginary concept invented by the human mind. Quantum physics is about the real world. It's a real, real conundrum. Another one, which is also closely related to physics, is the invention of, of the, de the development of non-Euclidean geometry. Geometry which doesn't satisfy the usual rules of Euclidean geometry about parallel lines, and was thought of as something that didn't really exist, but you could play around with, like the square root of minus one. Subsequently, it turned out to be very closely related to the kind of ideas involved in Einstein's theory of general relativity. So again, something which is on the one hand a purely mathematical invention with not, no reality, turns out indirectly to have a fundamental relationship to the real world. So this relationship between mathematics and the real world is very subtle. It's not straightforward. Now the orthodox view of physicists is that mathematics was, well, let me put it this way, the orthodox view of unthinking physicists is that mathematics was developed as a language and a tool to deal with the physical world. There's the physical world. People came along and said we have to have some technique to deal with it and with it we worked out some mathematical theory and that's all it is. It's sort of handmade for the physicists. But uh, Eugene Wigner, who was a famous mathematician, physicist, uh, he, he referred to the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and physics. And what did he mean by that? Well, uh, mathematics, if it's a tool for physics, it obviously would be useful. But what he observed was that its usefulness went far beyond the kind of usefulness you could expect of a humdrum tool developed on the job. It has far-reaching applications way beyond what you first thought about. And that's what he thought was unreasonable. Uh, <coughs> now, most mathematicians, I think, uh, are really believers in Plato's view of mathematics as having an existence out there, independent of the physical world. These theorems about uh, whatever they are, Euclidean geometry or Fermat's last theorem, they are things that have a permanent existence independent of the physical world. They are in the world of ideas. And two very well-known mathematicians who have that view are Roger Penrose and Alan Kahn. They, they have this view in a very strong form. I think my own view, slightly more, more um, halfway, would, I would like to say it this way. That mathematics organizes from the physical world. It originates, sorry, from the physical world. It comes from input to the physical world, but it is organized and developed by the human brain. The input comes from outside. Without that input, you wouldn't start. Once it's there, the human brain elaborates and develops a very ambitious program, which subsequently has enormous applications in the physical world. So it's, a, it's an intricate two-way process. Now, I mentioned before the fact that the human mind is part of the biological world. So let me pursue that a bit more. So let's talk about the biological perspective. And so let's start off with evolution. I hope in California you believe in evolution. Uh, and evolution uh, theory says that man evolved by natural selection uh, over a long billions of years. Uh, and of course, because of that, he has to be adapted to survive. If you didn't adapt to survive, you wouldn't be here today. So in particular, his mind has adapted to, to uh, and reflects physical reality. So in some sense, the fact that you're here, that you survived evolution, means your brain has to be in tune with the world outside. Otherwise, you would have e been eaten up by lions and tigers long ago. Now, so mathematical thinking at this level is an incidental consequence of evolution. The brain had to be developed in order to survive, 
But once you have the brain, you can use it for other things. You might buy your car originally to go to work, but having got it, you could also enjoy it by taking holidays. So things can be incidental consequences of something else. Uh, in particular, the rules of logic, which are, after all are you know, fa the foundation of clear thinking, and certainly the foundations of mathematics in a sense, these are really de deduced in the outside world of experience based on notions of cause and effect. In the outside world, you soon recognize that if you do this, that follows cause and effect, and cause and effect is essentially the same thing as the hypothesis and the con logical conclusion. So logic really is a reflection of cause and uh, effect in the physical world. But here is the point coming back to that Wigner made. In evolution, man only had to deal with the human scale. To survive, you had to be able to handle your opponents, and they were of your same order of magnitude as your size, sometimes a bit bigger, sometimes a bit smaller, but of the same order of magnitude. Uh, but mathematics has been able to deal with the, with the physical world at very vastly different scales. The very, very small, the nuclear, nuclear level, and the very, very large, the cosmological level. And this is what's surprising. Not surprising, perhaps, that mathematics can deal with the humdrum things of the ordinary scale we live in, but that the same mathematics can simultaneously apply to this enormous range of scales, that is something unexpected, fortunate. Uh, you know, if you're an optimist, you might hope to believe in it, but it's a rem remarkable fact. So that, that is what really Wigner had in mind, I think. Now, let me pursue a bit more the human brain um, from the point of view of not just of evolution, but of what actually goes on in the, in the human brain. I mean, the brain underlying the mind, the biological reality. This is really about neurophysiology. And current research in neurophysiology is beginning to shed new light on how the brain works, which you might say is the nature of mind. Uh, and I'll say a bit more about that as I go along. Uh, in particular, the rules of logic and grammar, which underpin both mathematics and language, appear to be hardwired in the brain. We are something that's born with the capacity to do mathematics. You may not realize it, but you were born with the capacity to do mathematics. And we're also born with the capacity to learn language. Language in the abstract, not any particular language. Depending where you grew up, you will learn Japanese, Chinese, or English. But you have the capacity hardwired in your brain. And the same is true, I claim, to some extent with mathematics. And this capacity is a consequence of evolution. Because of its successful applications, the brain was developed so that this was programmed in an early stage. Um, I'll, I'll mention a bit more about this. I have, this is a hobby of mine. You know, when you, uh, mathematics is serious, physics is now also serious, and neurophysiology is a sort of hobby. Um, I, I, a friend of mine who's a new, distinguished neurophysiologist does experiments on the human uh, mind, brain, uh, but you're glad to know that these days that doesn't involve cutting you open. Uh, uh, you can do it you know, without harming you. You put the patient in a scanner and you, a few bombard with a few protons and so on, but that doesn't do much harm. <laughs> and uh, then you get these scans which tell you uh, lots of information, what's happening, which part of the brain. Also, you get remarkably accurate results of very high temporal and spatial resolution. And you can also examine simultaneity, what's happening in different parts of the brain. So you can do really quite sophisticated experiments now uh, which pinpoint things with remarkable accuracy. So a lot is known, and a lot more is getting known, and, and undoubtedly in the next 50 years, this will be one of the big um, areas in the development of science. So uh, in this area, uh, my friend and I got involved in the following question. If you start with mathematics, uh, I want to know how does the brain hardwire mathematics, you can ask, what is the most fundamental notion in mathematics that you can look at? And in some sense, I, I suggested to him, the most fundamental notion in mathematics is that of magnitude, the size, and some things are bigger than others. Well, that's a very abstract notion, but the whole point about mathematics, it is abstract. And so, you know, we can talk about things with what, which are larger in volume, or, or larger in sound being larger, larger, one sound being large, another one being soft, or you can have light, high intensity light, or low intensity light, so the whole range of different kinds of sensitivity, sens senses, things you see with your senses, can be diagnosed as being big or small. Now, this, is a this is an abstract notion of magnitude. And mathematics starts off with such abstract notions. So you can ask, does the brain have an abstract notion of magnitude? 
Well, you can test that. Here you are, you can do an experimental test. You take your patients, you have a suitable number of them, you put them into the scanner, and you give them big and small in these different shapes. And you look and see in their brain what, what, what uh, lights up. And remarkably, you find the same bit of the brain lights up in each case. In other words, it isn't one bit of the brain that deals with sounds and lights, and they each handle the big and the small. They, all the common aspects of size is measured in one place. So that, I claim, is a demonstration, which you can actually carry out, proving that the first steps in the development of mathematics as an abstraction are hardwired in the brain. And obviously, this is just the beginning of what you might hope to carry out. And we have a program to do a bit more, and no doubt other people will do more. So I think we'll learn a lot in this way about exactly how mathematics is carried on in the brain. Now, I mentioned down here, these experiments in neurophysiology also uh, shed light on other things besides our ability to do mathematics. And I mentioned here the light they shed on the questions of consciousness and free will, two of the most controversial and debatable, you know, when you, when you start giving lectures on consciousness and free will, you get audiences much bigger than this. And, you know, you, you, uh, so I won't, I won't advertise this too much. Um, and, uh, but here, again, my friend, by his name is Samir Zeki, um, he has done some interesting experiments, I'm not involved with these, uh, in which he's demonstrated the, the following fact. Because the um, resolution in time is so sharp, you can find this out, if you want to have a cup of coffee, and you see the mug on the table, and you want to lift it up, so what do you think happens? Well, your brain says, I want a cup of coffee, you issue instructions to the hand, hand moves forward, picks up cup. That's what you think happens. Well, what actually happens, you can test by experiment. You look at the brain, with the cell, and you notice the exact moment when the person says, I've made the decision. And then you look at the exact moment when the hand starts to move towards the cup. And you find the hand moves to the cup before you think you've made the decision. So, you know, uh, have you decided to move towards the cup, or has your hand gone and then you subsequently... Uh, it's a tricky question. Of course, the time resolution is very small, and so you don't notice it. But the question about, you know, these questions are not as straightforward as they seem. And I claim developers in neurophysiology will mean a lot of these questions will tend to disappear. They will tend to be absorbed in some other scientific description. So, I think my conclusion on this one is that old philosophical questions, including the nature of mathematics, will be transformed by future research in neurophysiology. Uh, many of the questions we ask now will turn out not to be properly posed because we'll know more about how the brain actually thinks. And if you compare this with what's happened to the old question, which was very popular probably 50 years ago, you know, what is life? Well, people don't, you don't ask that anymore. We know so much about mechanisms of the double helix and DNA. That question has practically disappeared. You ask different questions. So these old questions, which were the province of philosophers in the past, and of course philosophers go on talking and talking and talking, never getting anywhere, and that's the nature of philosophy. You, know, you can do it for 2,000 years and you still ask the same questions. But when, when the question l lends itself to a scientific experiment, then you can get an answer. And the answer doesn't necessarily mean that the question is answered. It simply means that the nature of the question is undermined or examined. The whole framework is altered. And so I think that the more we learn about the human brain, the more we'll be able to alter the way in which these questions are, are asked about the nature of mathematics and is it internal or is it external if a lot of it is hardwired we'll know some of it is internal uh, and so the conclusion here is really that our, our brain uh, interprets or uh, makes pictures of the outside world in its own terms in terms which is hardwired and, but already the brain has to um, have an abstraction process which corresponds to what mathematics does. Mathematics is all about abstraction. You take lots of things, you unify them by throwing away the irrelevant considerations. Five is the same, five apples and five oranges and all that all share the property of being five. So you abstract out from the world outside and in the brain there is some box that has this notion abstract on it and it, it fits into there. <coughs> and the process of um, abstraction actually, uh, my friend Zeki says, is actually much more prevalent in the way the mind works than you might think. When you look at the way you see things, vision, now you, people naively think, well, easy, vision, light comes in, light photons hit, the, hit you, and you just take all these signals and you just uh, look at what you get. But that's not all true. 
the brain has to organize what it gets and it has to give meaning to what it gets, sees. And there's a lot of subtlety there, as you know, there are lots of optical illusions where the brain can change its mind about what it sees and suddenly it sees a different picture. So, seeing uh, is a question of, is an abstract process. You form an abstract picture of what it is you're thinking and you fit the data to it. So, abstraction is already present in the way the human brain works with respect to vision, for example. If you didn't make a lot of abstraction, you would never be able to see things. This is already, you can see this with people who have been blind from birth and suddenly some operation takes place and they can see. And they're enormously confused. Their eyes work perfectly from a purely physiological effect, but they don't understand the data. They don't know that there are, there are people who all look like slightly different, but are all people. They don't have the uh, sort of struct, logical structure that, that enables them to understand what they see. Well, that was really my digression into uh, biology and evolution, because I think it's important to understand that the human brain is part of the outside world, and you can't divorce it from that. You can't discuss these things independently of recognizing that fact. But let me go back now to straightforward questions about the history of physics. Now, the ancient view of the heavens uh, was, of course, uh, there were stars, there were planets, and people have known for a long time that the planets moved around in funny ways, and days, the Greeks onwards, uh, there were, these things were handled, uh, and there was a famous theory developed by Ptolemy uh, of epicycles, which described an epicycle was consisted of circles rolling on circles. The Greeks thought that the circle was the perfect object, and therefore the, the, the heavens should be built on perfect circles. Well, they that found that wasn't quite good enough. There were differences, so they got the idea of rolling one circle on another circle, and if that wasn't good enough, you put a third circle on the third. So by having lots and lots of circles rolling on circles, you could start to explain the data. Uh, and that's not very far removed from the way more recent physicists have explained more complicated things. So, um, the, 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 you, this way, they got remarkable agreement with experiment. The, 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 the tables of Ptolemy stood up for about a thousand years. They explained the motions of the planets uh, to within the kind of accuracy that was perfectly adequate for the observations that they could make. And, in fact, there was really no need for a theory to replace that. But, of course, we know that theory was replaced, and it started off with Copernicus's views about the sun being at the center of, of the universe, uh, of the planetary system, planets going around it, and the purpose of these new theories that came forward was not actually to get better observations, it was to get a simpler view of the heavens. The old theory may have been satisfactory to provide uh, accurate data for observations, but it wasn't particularly elegant, it wasn't particularly simple. And mm, mathematicians and physicists for a long time have always been driven by the impulse to look for simple theories, which, uh, simple theory which has a complicate, explains complicated phenomena. And of course the theories developed first by Copernicus and then by Kepler and eventually by Newton were enormously simpler in some basic way than the complications of the epicycles. And therefore we prefer them. We believe those theories much better because they are inherently simple and elegant, and yet they explain things as well as before, and perhaps better. But on the way, let me comment about Kep Kepler. <laughs> Kepler wanted to explain uh, the facts that were already known from before, about the planets, how many planets there were, what the sizes of the planets were. You now know, nowadays know that correspondingly people try to understand the masses of elementary particles. The same search for understanding the why things are as they, as they, uh, as they seem to be, is there some real reason why these numbers are what they are? And he had you know, looked around for something to explain the numbers of planets and how, what the sizes of their orbits. And he came up with a beautiful idea, which was to relate them to the famous five, five platonic solids, the cube, the icosahedron, the dodecahedron, and so on, which had been known since the time of Plato, were beautiful, symmetrical, regular solids. And he, these would be known and they're very beautiful, so he thought, well, perhaps I can use them. And he played it around with them and he found, remarkably, that um, they fitted in quite nicely. And you could explain all that in terms of this very elegant theory of um, the platonic solids. So let me show you a few of the pictures. Well, first of all, just here is the most famous of the regular solids, the icosahedron, uh, which is made up of 20 triangles. They're colored here just to help you see it. Uh, and that's the most famous of them. And then the other ones are a bit simpler. 
Now, these, I say, have been known since the time of Plato, 2,500 years ago. Uh, but I was very surprised to find out, not that long ago, that they're much older than that. And they were known to two, in the years 2000 BC. Not in the centers of civilization, not in ancient Greece or Mesopotamia or where all the great civilizations were, but in the country I now live in, namely Scotland. Uh, in ancient Scotland, 2000 BC, when people were really in the Stone Age, people had discovered these, uh, these regular solids, and here is a picture taken from uh, models that you can see in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. It's a bit of a rough picture, but without any doubt, you can see here the five regular solids hewn out of stone. But the shape is obviously quite clear. So they were in the Stone Age, there they are, they're stone. And yet somebody there, some mathematical genius, had discovered these shapes. Actually not trivial to discover the icosahedron. The cube and the tetrahedron are quite easy to see. But the icosahedron is, we mathematicians think, rather sophisticated. It takes a bit of theory. And yet these chaps who didn't have, presumably, even paper and pencil, uh, somehow discovered these. I was very struck by this. I thought, well, good Lord, where were these chaps? What, what were they doing? And then I made many of the inquiries. It turned out there's not one set of these. There are hundreds of these in Scotland, all over the place. You find them. They're sort of very prevalent. So obviously they played some important part in the civilization of the time no doubt some religious or ritual significance. Uh, whoever found them clearly persuaded his colleagues that they were a good deal. He probably made a lot of money out of it. So, uh, I, I think this is, uh, I mean, I'm doing a bit of propaganda for Scotland, uh, you know, what you've got to do when you're a foreign traveller. I'll come back to some other contributions. By the way, David Hume was a Scot, I forgot to mention that. Now, <laughs> um, uh, Kepler's theory about, which, about, about the regular solids, he, he convinced himself that they were the explanation for the sizes of the orbits. So that's a little bit of text which you can just, but there are the sort of sketches of the figures for you. And here is a pic from his a diagram from his book. And there is, you can roughly get the idea. Here is a sort of picture of, um, which gives you the idea of one regular solid embedded in a sphere, which is in the next one. His idea was that the, these regular solids fitted nicely between the planetary orbits, and if you put them in the right order, you've got uh, a good approximation to the sizes of the orbits. It was a beautiful theory. Marvelous mathematics, the, the universe, great. And the accuracy was pretty good. Uh, unfortunately, of course, it, experimental evidence subsequently produced another planet, and the theory rather collapsed. Uh, it, it, it happens that good mathematics may not be ultimately the right one, uh, but you try again. And nowadays, you know that uh, physicists are trying to uh, unify all the laws of nature. That's the great search at the moment. And um, people talk about the theory, grand unified theory. It's just, uh, no, the theory of everything, grand unified. Well, the first grand unified theory we understand is Kepler's, because here is something piece of his book. Now, it's uh, called The Harmony of the World. Uh, it's, the text is very small, it's also in Latin. So, to help you read it, I'll just tell you the, the, the key words that enter. This is a theory about geometry, architecture, harmony, metaphysics, psychology, astrology astronomy. So, it, I think the theory of everything in a really grand way. And he, he, he made no bones about it. This is the theory. It was, you know, the first grand, grand unified theory, yeah, but there will be others later. Now, of course, after Kepler, as I mentioned, we move on to the modern era. And the modern era, and scientifically speaking, really dates from Newton. And in the 17th century, uh, of course, his, his uh, theory of of, gravi of Newtonian gravity uh, successfully dealt with not only the planets, but with comets, the tides, and of course the famous apples that fall from trees. Uh, <coughs> and th from then onwards, the Newtonian paradigm has been the model for all physical theories. Find a simple universal law, such as the inverse square law of gravitation, from which every complicated phenomenon can be deduced, perhaps with a great deal of effort. I think it's important to emphasize that second part, because in fact Newton not only thought of the, the laws of, of gravity in that sense, but he also simultaneously developed the calculus to, with, as part of, with also contributions of others, but the development of the calculus was enable, enabled him to take this formula for the, the forces and deduce from it the exact orbits of the planet. So it was a tremendous achievement not only to take an idea, but to convert it into mathematical form from which you can make predictions. 
It was those two together that made Newton, of course, both a famous math great mathematician and a great physicist. And, and that model for subsequent theories has been the model for, for all progress. To find a simple law which can be expressed in mathematical terms uh, together with the development of the necessary tools, calculus, and its various uh, higher forms from which everything else can be deduced. Now, the first, the next big step after uh, Newton in the history of physics is undoubtedly that of Clark Maxwell, who did for electromagnetism what Newton had done for gravitation. There are fundamental equations for electromagnetism. They're more complicated than those of gravity, but equally beautiful. And this is the sort of, sort of great development of the 19th century uh, following 200 years after Newton. And just in case you didn't know it, James Clark Maxwell was a Scot. Uh, uh, and I've been in his house where, where, he, where he was born, lived, which is now a mathematical institute. And I'll show you a picture. Uh, one, another picture after Plato, Clark Maxwell is another of my heroes. Um, <clears throat> so, um, of course, from uh, electromagnetism, uh, which is fundamentally simple, are enormous practical applications of importance. Uh, the power that we have, to, uh, the light that we get, the radios, the computers, all of these rest on electromagnetism. And Richard Feynman, who is well known, who is well known in these parts and was given to iconoclastic statements, is reputed to have said that 2,000 years from now, when people look back, the only name that they will remember is that of Maxwell. I think he even forgot about Newton. So, I mean, that's a strong statement. He was inclined to exaggeration, but it indicates the nature of the enormous importance of electromagnetism and of the remarkable, beautiful form of the equations which Maxwell discovered. So, we have to pay our homage to the great man, and so here he is. It's a great help in those days that people have these impressive beards. It added to their dignity. I'm afraid the present generation, with some exceptions, um, don't have beers of the same <laughs> character uh, and it, it certainly uh, I think uh, makes you clearly, clearly a man of some, some um, uh, distinction I should say Carl Maxwell besides being a great scientist was actually an extremely nice man they didn't always get together a very modest man there's a m rather fine um, correspondence between Maxwell and Faraday Faraday was the sort of uneducated man who barehanded, so to speak, did experiments which discovered experimentally the laws of electromagnetism in a concrete way and it was Maxwell who was much more mathematically skilled and educated who produced the equations and when Maxwell produced his equations he wrote a letter to Faraday a very humble letter saying, you know I offer you my paper which has a, some modest equations in them which I've tried to encapsulate all your marvelous discoveries uh, and Faraday wrote back equally humble letter saying I'm overwhelmed by the beauty of the equations which uh, treat my small experiments it was a, I think they're both genuinely modest it was a very rare nice occasion with mutual admiration between great scientists now moving on to the 20th century the early part of the 20th century other things were moving on Einstein's theory of special relativity was, you know, the one which really combined in this fundamental way the com space and time to see that you had to think of these as a unity. And uh, this is, of course, one of the big uh, moments in the history of science because this separation of space and time seems to be an obvious thing for life. We, well, we see it, it's part of our experience, and you have to conquer that to make progress with the fundamental physics. So the nations are then, you know, what is reality, what is the, where we live and our time and our space begins to get complicated. We have this combined object which doesn't at all fit with our notion of reality yet seems to be necessary to deal with the practical world of physics. And then from beyond special relativity Einstein moved on of course uh, to general relativity in which he extended special relativity and he incorporated he, he, he also um, replaced Newtonian theory by a, a much more sub significant and uh, beautiful theory which explains gravitation as due to the curvature of space-time. This theory uh, is also influenced by Maxwell's work on the velocity of light and other things come into it but basically it's a geometrical idea that says curvature, space in some like simple-minded way is what things, makes things move, what gravitational force. Roughly speaking you think uh, the, the, the well of, of things attract things down in some curved space-time and it, it can be formulated in comparatively simple mathematical equations. 
Now, I put an asterisk here. You know, when you have things in books, quite often they put an asterisk. Pay, pay attention here. Uh, because general relativity in the history of science has a very special role. Not only because of its importance, but because, in a way, it was not a result of experimental observations being... You see, science, according to some people, according to, for example, Francis Bacon, was you did a lot of experiments, you got a lot of data, you looked at the data, and then you saw how to organize the data, and from that you deduced the form of the laws. That's the deductive version of science. The other view, which goes back to Aristotle, is you don't go out in the experimental world and do experiments, you sit in your study and think. And from pure thought alone, you can work it all out. Well, those are the two extreme views. And, of course, science for a long time was handicapped by the Aristotelian view that you didn't need to do experiments. If you thought it out, you could work it out from theory. But Einstein's general relativity is a case of remarkable success, but he did think it out from scratch. He went into his library. Uh, nobody said you have to have a new theory of gravity. There was a perfectly good theory of gravity, Newton. There was a good theory of Maxwell's equations covered electromagnetism. And that covered most of the known facts. There were maybe a few marginal deviations here and there, which are no doubt due to some small effects. But Einstein was searching for something which would unify the things known at the time for purely aesthetic fundamental beliefs. He believed in the unification as a sort of act of faith. And uh, he was searching for it, even if nobody else was looking for it. And it took him ten years of hard work and learning lots of things before he came up with the idea. It was a, a very unusual event because the, the, it wasn't felt at all by the requirement to satisfy some ex experimental observations. Subsequently, of course, it has been put to the test many times and been uh, remarkably um, verified large accuracy, both in the small scales that happen around the planetary system with the deviation of light uh, around stars, planets, and on the large scale with black holes and galaxies and curvature. So, enormous um, success, but the motivation was a human one. It was a, the search for a simple unified theory which impelled him to do that. <coughs> that doesn't follow that that will always work, but it was a remarkable case of success. Now, in the 1920s, we move into a different era with the advent of quantum mechanics. Now, quantum mechanics was a totally new viewpoint again, and it totally transformed our view of reality again, because, for example, it, it, it encoded complex numbers, which I told you don't exist. So already, you're on shaky ground. And then it, there was this uncertainty principle that came out, you didn't know where you were. You know, very much a, <clears throat> not at all fitting with our normal um, beliefs. But it was a spectacular success. At the atomic level, it solved all the difficult unsolved problems at the time, and it has led to important applications, of course, ever since. Now, this quantum mechanics <coughs> was um, very different from Einstein's general relativity. It was developed in response to experimental facts. People made experiments and got surprising results, for which there was no current explanation. And these results built up until there was an embarrassing collection of results that nobody could understand. And so, eventually, a new theory had to be developed, which would incorporate them all and explain them. So it was driven by experimental need. And the theory came out in response to that need. Unlike Einstein's theory, which was driven purely by internal thought. I think purely internal thought would never have led to quantum mechanics. It seems so far removed from the world of experience, very difficult to know how it would relate to the real world. Einstein's theory was built on ideas of geometry and space, which are much more, much closer to our normal life, and therefore was amenable, in some sense, to pure thought. Now, the mathematics of quantum mechanics is vastly more sophisticated than the mathematics of Newton and Maxwell and early, or Einstein. It's all the magnitude more, more complicated. Um, and, of course, uh, when it first arose, there were, it didn't at all fit into the kind of framework that Einstein uh, liked. This was not the sort of point of view Einstein wanted to adopt, and he argued for, for all the rest of his life with Niels Bohr, the one of the pioneers of new quantum theory, uh, he would, they would have a long debate taking place in, in, by letters in which Einstein would keep making, raising objections and Bohr would keep um, dealing with them. Uh, and this went on for years. And <clears throat> uh, according to the certainly orthodox view of the time, Einstein lost that battle. He became a sort of uh, held a minority view, was regarded as slightly um, fuddy daddy in his old age, but he never accepted quantum theory. Einstein did not believe in quantum mechanics as a final theory. He, he believed, obviously, he had to accept that it was a remarkably successful theory in practical terms, but as a fundamental theory, he found it 
unpalatable. And he tried very hard to get around that, and he also tried to develop a unified theory which would incorporate general relativity and electromagnetism. And both, on both counts, the orthodox view of Einstein was wrong. There was no such thing as a unified theory of the kind he was searching for, and quantum mechanics was correct, and he was wrong to ignore it. But by the mid-20th century, more expensive mental data came along, the theory of nuclear forces was being developed, dealing with things at smaller and smaller levels, and late, the way later on that these were understood was actually to go back and bring in some geometry, some ideas which were related to Maxwell's uh, theories, and a new theory were developed, which in some sense would have pleased Einstein, because they had more geometry built into them, and they were closer to what he thought about, uh, but quantum mechanics was still present, and general relativity was not included, so Einstein would only have crapped rather quietly. Now in the last quarter of the 20th century, things have moved on further still. What well, arises what's called string theory, very strongly represented here in the workshop that's going on at the present time, which aims to combine all the forces of nature, the gravitational force, the electromagnetic force, the, nu force, the nuclear forces, into a theory of everything. Another version of what Kepler was trying to do, hopefully this time closer to the truth. Uh, and of course this would, if he was completed, would be Einstein's dream, the unification that he was searching for would be what he was after, except of course it would still suffer from the defect of embodying quantum mechanics, he would not be totally satisfied. Now one of the features of string theory, uh, there are many features of string theory, is that it actually requires uh, not the four dimensions of space-time, but some more dimensions, six or seven more according to taste, uh, adding up to ten or eleven altogether, and then these ten or eleven dimensions, uh, things take place in the extra dimensions on some very, very small scales, they're small curled up little circles and so on, which you don't normally see, except when you have very high energies and you go to great accelerators, then you can start to penetrate those scales. So normal life is four dimensional, but there are extra hidden dimensions that you don't see, but are necessary to understand what's happening at the atomic scale. That's one big uh, difference from our real world, extra dimensions. Second one is the basic objects are not the traditional point particle which we started, the, the point of Euclid, which became a point particle in Newtonian time and attracted each other and so on. Now the points are replaced by one dimensional things, strings. Not pieces of string, you understand, but wiggles. Uh, and the strings can either have ends, they're called open strings, or they can be closed, and they correspond to closed strings. And in some sense, the closed strings are, correspond to the gravitational force, and the other strings correspond to the other forces. These are very, very sophisticated geometry involved in this, and um, this uses about almost every bit of mathematics we know goes into these things. That's why mathematicians have been attracted to recent ideas in string theory. Everything they know is being used, and even things they don't know. And we learn by going talking to the physicists about new ideas coming out of the physics. But there are some, and included amongst all these things that we use, the physicists use, the platonic solids are there. They are, they are actually closely related to the, some of the exceptional groups that appear in the theory. So Kepler, in some sense, has got in by the back door. Um, now, the, the, one of the drawbacks of the current theory, which I'll just mention briefly, is there's no unique string theory which is supposed to correspond to our world, but there are many different ones, but in some sense they're all meant to be equivalent, different pictures of the same, uh, of the same physics. So this again raises the question, what's happened to our real world? You know, if there are many different ways of describing it, all equally good, and some of them even involve different dimensions, you know, what's happened to reality? You know, first of all, reality is hard to get more complicated, you brought in time, then you brought in more dimensions, then you start to do wiggly strings, and by this time you're really in a bizarre world, and you can say, well, is this the real world? Is this what the real world is? Well, if it explains experimental data, it has some relation to reality, but it's, it certainly ma makes the old questions about the nature of reality and the relation of theory and experiment even more difficult. And quantum mechanics still remains the basic framework throughout with its complications and philosophical difficulties. Let me digress a bit to, this, this is getting rather heavy now, uh, say a bit by extra dimensions and draw your attention to this marvelous book uh, called Flatland that was written in the last century by a Cambridge uh, uh, minister called Edwin Abbott and it's called A Romance of Many Dimensions and what it is a story, uh, a sort of uh, parable if you like about this two-dimensional world where everybody lives in the plane, they don't have any, any height and uh, then 
a being from three dimensions floats down in the middle of them and starts to tell them about the third dimension. And of course they don't believe him. And it's, but the idea is that if you are on the three dimensions and somebody comes down from a fourth or fifth or sixth dimension, equally well we have difficulty understanding them. So by comparing ourselves with these fictional story, you, you learn something. And in this two-dimensional world, he not, not only is it meant to be a science, less, a science lesson, it's also meant to be a social critique. Um, the, this two-dimensional world has a very elaborate social structure, modelled, of course, on the English social structure of the time in Victorian England, in which um, uh, the people are polygonal in shape, and they have different shapes. Now, the basic workers are triangles. And uh, the low, lower class workers who do the hard work, they have an acute angle triangle, as they move up the social hierarchy and get into the middle classes, they become equilateral triangles. And then the next generation after them moves higher up, they become squares. And the next generation become pentagons. And eventually, after hundreds of years, you reach the higher aristocracy and you nearly a circle. The circle is a kind of priesthood, the ultimate perfect circle. But on the way, the more size you have, the higher up you are. It's a very nice analogy. With, and of course, I should point out that the lowest form of human life are the females. They are just one-dimensional segments. And being one-dimensional, they pose a hazard. If you approach you edge on, you don't see them. So they have to give advance warning that they're coming. Uh, and this picture on the outside is a picture of the, 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 uh, the Pentagon, who is kind of squire, and inside his house is divided into rooms for his various family and so on. It's a very beautiful uh, uh, story with, with a lot of both um, social critique and scientific uh, um, explanation in it. <laughs> now, <coughs> this, uh, uh, this, these new string theories have had remarkable applications in mathematics. Um, and one of the, one of the, of the consequences of the interaction between mathematicians and physicists have been mathematicians have learned a lot of new ideas and even proved a lot of results in mathematics that seem to have no relation with physics. Uh, I'll just flash on the board here a few things to tell you this. That for example, the algebraic geometry, which is about drawing curves which are given by algebraic equations and doing, asking problems about them, which are very far removed from anything to do with physics. These questions have been solved by ideas coming from physics. Questions about knots, the topology of how you draw complicated bits of string, nothing to do with strings or string theory. These have been solved, old problems have been solved by using ideas of physics. Problems which have been around in mathematics for hundreds of years. And there are others as well. So there's a vast area of new results in mathematics, which come out of this interaction, which seem to be quite unrelated to physics. And of course, it's a reflection of the fact that this new physics had to take on board whole areas of mathematics, which seemed far away from the present at the beginning, and turn out, nevertheless, to be useful, and partly that's because they're supposed to be, represent what's happening in extra little dimensions you don't see. What you don't see is where all the nice mathematics goes in. So again, its relationship with the real world is, is very, very, very bizarre. So, uh, there's been this remarkable impact on pure mathematics. Many new results have come out, and that is, in some sense, very mysterious. We've learnt things about mathematics, about the mathematics of the mind, from what appear to be things about the physical world through this dictionary of going through various physical the theories. Now, if the present view, orthodox view, is correct, and the final theory is going to emerge soon, you know, next week or the week after. Uh, the string theory is finally finished. Then this institute closes down. There will be nothing more to do. Uh, so we hope it doesn't happen too soon. Uh, we will discover a universe built on some fantastically intricate mathematics. Well, you know, it's a sort of a... This brings us back to the question of what is reality? Is reality built out of, the, out of this vastly complicated mathematical structure which the human brain with the help from the physical world has evolved, is that the secret of reality? Now it's a difficult notion to believe. Um, well, perhaps there are alternatives. At least we should raise the question. Is there some new paradigm needed? Is there some new way of looking at things? Perhaps the complicated mathematics we use is just in the eye of the beholder. Perhaps we, we use all those mathematics because we've got it and nothing else we can do. But perhaps there is a final alternative way of looking at it which will shed light and uh, make great progress. So that's a question we can ask and uh, the few, only the future will tell whether that's possible. At the present time, uh, I should say that the attitude of physicists in general, they fall into many classes. There are those hard-boiled physicists who only believe in you know, things they can do with their hands and they can't see these strings. So they dis dismiss string theory as fancy mathematics unrelated to the, world, to the real world. 
then uh, there are other people, of course, who believe that the, the, the fact that the mathematical applications of string theory have proved so powerful must mean they're on the right track. And so in some sense, even though they can't carry out experiments, test these theories at the present time, the mathematical backup gives them confidence they're going well. So one of the benefits we give to the physicists is confidence. I mean, we're happy to do that. Uh, and so the general, those who are working in string theory hope that by pushing forward, making a bit of progress, a bit of progress there, finally, the uh, final unified theory, the great goal of Einstein or other, will emerge. Uh, but we would hope that this final theory to emerge satisfies at least Einstein's criterion of simplicity and elegance. Because if eventually a theory is so complicated of this kind, you feel rather, this theory, is that the end of the long search? Is that what we've been searching for all this time? You look for the Holy Grail, and what do you find? An enormously complex big tower with all sorts of uh, things built out of it. It, it. It's not somehow ultimately satisfying. We hope that something can be, which is more elegant will emerge. But uh, that's, that's perhaps a pipe dream, perhaps it won't happen. And so uh, I, I can't uh, I predict the future. But uh, I, that's my hope, rest of the belief. Now, um, I was recently reading a book, and those, which you might, I don't know if I can recommend it to you, but it's a book uh, by Lawrence Krauss, who's a physicist, who is not, I should say, a string theorist himself. Uh, but he's written a book which tries to describe what's happening, including string theory, and he expresses some reservations about it. But it's quite a well-written book, and it covers a lot of things besides uh, physics and mathematics. It talks about art and philosophy. You know, it's kind of a bit like my lecture here, uh, very sort of uh, more broad brush stuff. Um, and, but I find it quite interesting to read. I read it on an airplane coming over, kind of book you can read in an airplane. So you know, you, if you're caught in a traffic jam, it's a useful book to read. Well, I think I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to start by asking a question. Um, you know, when I think about the complicated math that we have needed and seem to need and probably will need even more, uh, I always thought that well, it only looks complicated because it's new and it's only a year old or 20 years old or 100 years old, but in a few hundred years it'll look simple. And that seems to me what happens in physics for sure. Do you really, but you seem to believe that in some sense the mathematics that's being used now in, in string theory and physics is in some sense inherently complicated, inherently too complicated. Uh, well, well, obviously it's certainly true that things which seem at the first sight to be complicated when you understand them better uh, uh, and when you start learning them in textbooks become, you're used to them, you accept them. But I think here, I, I think there is some diff inherent uh, complexity here which is not of that kind. Uh, it's the, I suppose the fact is that there is no, you know, unlike the other theories we've had before, you can't, having done all the hard work, you can't say, well, I'm now going to give, give a course on this to students and say, we start at page one, here's the fundamental principle we started from, here are the basic equations, let's get going. You can't do that. There is, at the moment, there is no simple starting point. You go through a long history of evolution, you build bits on bits and pieces. So the theory, at the moment, it doesn't sort of grow from a single sort of seed. It seems to be uh, put together from lots of different places. So I think it's, it's still missing that. Now, it may get that. If it gets that, that may shed light on it all, and it may then acquire the kind of unity it at present lacks. But even within that, it certainly uses so much mathematics, and, you know... The mathematics in it is of such a varied kind and so many bits and pieces, but an awful lot of different things. So even the, the variety and nature of the things that go into it are, are add to the complexity. So it, it may, of course, everything will get simplified in time, but at the present time it looks to me a different order of magnitude from the theories we've had in the past, in that sense. Uh, if there was intelligent life someplace else in the universe, would their mathematics be different? And if their mathematics were different, would the physics be different? But then how could that be? Yes, sir. Well, um, obviously, you know, if there is intelligent life out somewhere in the universe, and certainly there are people who keep looking for it, um, uh, insofar as the, 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 uh, 
we believe that mathematics is out there, waiting to be discovered, if you like, then, of course, these chaps can find it as well as we can. Um, it's as far as it's uh, been developed in order to reflect on the physics outside, they live, live in the same universe, maybe it's a slightly higher temperature or lower temperature, but fundamentally the same universe. Therefore, they will have the same data in which to extract things. So, the two ingredients, the, app, the, w real, the world of ideas, which is somehow independent of the physical world, and the physical world, are both there, so they've got the raw materials to make the same objects. But, of course, they might do them in a different package, even in mathematics. People could develop alternative ways of looking at a particular theory. They might be equivalent, but not quite presented the same way. But, I inherently, I think, I believe, it would be the same sort of mathematics and the same sort of physics. But, uh, uh, perhaps at a superficial level, there would, there would be a lot of translation to be done. They wouldn't speak the same language exactly. You'd have to work hard on the... Like, you know, people of different countries speak the same language in some fundamental sense. You've got to go through all the dictionary. I think it'd be of that... But, of course, since we don't know whether these people exist and what kind they... This is pretty speculative. <laughs> Uh, you you had the quote from Kronecker that uh, that only uh, integers are fundamental and we've invented everything else, but didn't we also invent the integers because um, we can only directly perceive a very small quantity, you know, maybe three, four, five things, and after that we have a theory that if you name things one after the other, that that tells you the quantity of things. So it seems that. Uh, the complex numbers are, are really not any more imaginary than the integers, are they? Oh, no. <laughs> you made a jump there that I didn't follow. The, 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 uh, I mean, uh, the fact that, the, that uh, you know, we, 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 of course, you might say one, two, and three were made by God, then we made the rest uh, by induction. Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, and, that, and some things are certainly true. That, that are, for example, there aren't, you know, the universe, whatever it is, if you can count, well, eventually the numbers will stop, but it, that, there aren't more than ten to the so-and-so things in the universe. So, in that sense, uh, God didn't make those other big numbers. They're not there, but they are part of the human mind because we envisage this infinite sequence. So, I think in that sense, you, 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 you have, a, have a point. You could have had a good argument with Kronecker. I'm not defending Kronecker, but I think uh, uh, if you quibble over the integers, you know, you're really going back very far. There are many more difficult things after, after that. So, by saying God made the integers, man made the rest. He was trying to emphasize all the superstructure we built. And imaginary numbers, I think, are certainly part of that structure. God didn't make the imaginary numbers in mathematics. He may have made them in quantum mechanics, but you know, that was another story. Uh, back in the late 50s and early 60s when I was at university, uh, the uh, mathematics and physics departments were quite a ways from each other. And uh, I remember a mathematics professor saying that mathematics was 30 years in advance of physics. I think he was talking about applied mathematics. Uh, but you intimate now with string theory that it's a lot closer, that there's a hunger for new mathematics to try to explain what's going on? Um, well, the, 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 the physics that's being worked on for string theory has certainly required uh, very sophisticated mathematics some of which was there just around the corner, some of which was still being created, and some of which is suggested for the mathematicians to develop after the event. So, in that sense, the physicists are not uh, behind in their mathematical needs and uses. They are actually right up front, and perhaps a bit in the, in the vanguard in this sense. Uh, of course, mathematics develops in all sorts of directions. In certain directions, they may be doing things which uh, at the moment don't have any applications in physics, and they may be far ahead, and the physicists will catch up with them later. But in the areas of overlap, which are very substantial, uh, the physics and mathematics have now converged quite well, so that you know, you're advancing on a common front in some sense. Uh, whereas perhaps in the past there was a big gap. Uh, physicists were a long way out doing this, and mathematicians were a long way doing that. Uh, but now they really come quite close together. There's a hand back there. You said that imaginary numbers kind of uh, became a kind of reality with quantum mechanics, but everything that's really measurable is has to become a real number. 
isn't it just a tool to formulate the, the wave mechanics, whatever you want to call it? Well, uh, of course, it's certainly true that you, you can't ma measure imaginary numbers. Uh, uh, no physicist is that clever yet. But uh, the role that the, the quantum mechanics is a very elaborate theoretical structure with which you can manipulate ideas and get numbers out of the end. And without that elaborate structure, you couldn't be able to get very far. Uh, you would be just stuck with your experiment. So the theory is pretty well essential to understand what you're doing. In quantum. And the complex numbers play a very fundamental role in that theory. So I think the, the physical theory of quantum mechanics couldn't exist without complex numbers in it, or at least only in a very disguised way, even though, of course, what you measure. So that really embodies the, the, the problem, as I mentioned before, that, that imaginary numbers don't exist, except things in the mind, yet they're intimately tied up with the practical world through this theory called quantum mechanics. And there you've got your big dilemma, you know, the diff how you connect up things in the mind with the reality outside. And the imaginary numbers really encapsulate that very well indeed. run. Thanks. So uh, if I'm connecting the dots uh, perhaps in the way that, that you uh, intended, um, I'm, I'm drawing the analogy between uh, string theory of today and epicycles of uh, the uh, pastimes. No offense to the many distinguished string theorists here. Um, and so that you're suggesting we need a, a Kepler type event to simplify this complicated explanation. First of all, is that an accurate assessment of sort of your philosophical perspective on the state of string um, theory? And I was so tongue in cheek think, refer, comparing epicycles with perturbation expansion. You know, think you, you make more and more accurate uh, corrections to get the right answer. And that's what epicycles were. They were perturbation expansion. Uh, and of course, if you get a real understanding of theory, you get away with that. Newtonian theory got away with that. If we can, we like to get, is a theory in which somehow all this expansion by perturbation theory, uh, which takes place in various levels of quantum field theory, and string theory uh, is only seen as, as, a, as a tool later on and isn't seen as fundamental. So I, I, it's tongue in cheek, but uh, I, you know, epicycles are nice things that we understand. You may not understand string theory and perturbation theory, you can understand epicycles. So I, I guess the, the follow on question is. Um uh, as I recall, the, the, the history of, of Kepler, it was quite some time after the development of his theory before there was broad acceptance uh, of it. Are there competing theories to string theory that have the sort of um, uh, simplicity that, that uh, we're looking for but are, are a couple hundred years away from <laughs> uh, gaining broad acceptance? Well, I'm sorry, Kepler's theory is about... I mean, uh, <laughs> but as he was not, of course, accepted. I mean, his, his you know, work on elliptical orbits was, of course, accepted. Uh, and the, the real theory didn't come until Newton came along later. So, I mean, it would be nice if, you know, some years down the line, new Newton and new Einstein comes along and manages to shed light on the present theory so that it looks as simple uh, as these other theories from which you can deduce all the present stuff by suitable uh, expansion and calculations. Whether that will happen is, you know, the unknown. We may be left with what we've got in some form as a big, tall building, uh, looking a bit ungainly, or it may be replaced by some beautiful piece of architecture which looks different. That's the question. I have a question regarding experimental verification, which it seems to me it itself is getting more abstract. That you're supposedly measuring reality, but sometimes interpreting exactly what you're measuring is not entirely straightforward? I think you're, you're certainly right, and you put your finger on the point. Experiments, actually, are never what they seem. Uh, I mean, an experiment always needs an interpretation of the context. Uh, it is always part of a theory, uh, even if only a sort of implicit theory. You, you do something, but you have to go through various theoretical explanation to see what it is you're doing and compare it. So uh, the, there is no total separation of experiment and theory. Every experiment you do, you do a certain amount of theory even to get going. You've got to convert something into something else. And so uh, they're not, they're not sort of very far apart uh, and uh, you have to have a lot of theory even to begin to understand what experiment you're doing. Uh, there's no, 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 no really clear separation. 
without some theoretical framework, it doesn't make sense to look at the data. You don't, you know, these, especially these days, they're so complicated. You have to have a vast amount of theory even to, to see what these things are supposed to mean. And of course, if you had different theory, you might interpret them differently. Yeah. The, doesn't the complexity come from having extra dimensions? Sorry, what was that? Doesn't the complexity come from having more dimensions? How can you have something simple if you have so many dimensions? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the question about the extra dimensions is, comes down to the question, uh, do you, are they really there? <laughs> do you believe that these are really physical dimensions? Or are they part of the mathematical intellectual structure which we built in order to explain the data we have? If, if they're the latter, uh, they may have a sort of reality in some abstract mathematical sense because they correspond to real things, like the square root of minus one, uh, or they may be just tools and you could have different pictures, even with different numbers of dimensions, all of which will describe the same end product. So the, the status of these extra dimensions, I think, is still you know, open. Uh, exactly what role they play, how you should think of them, are they uh, genuinely thought of as real in some sense, whatever that means? Are they mathematical devices to get you get answers? Are they provisional? Are they sort of alternatives to one another? Uh, you know, I think all of these questions are valid questions, and I don't think we are in a firm position to give the answer. And maybe even some of these things are simultaneously true. You know, it's very hard to separate out what is real and what is mathematical. I try to illustrate these questions are not that straightforward to answer yes or no. Well, maybe. Uh, with that answer, <laughs> it's a good place to end. And, and let me remind you that you will, those of you who are friends, have a chance to ask Professor Morrison all these questions and more <laughs> in the chalk talk. And let's thank uh, Sir Michael Atia again for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Vic. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not bad at all. <laughs>